one of the main reasons that it's important to have a timeline in that, so you can just go ahead and start. We're going to do the countdown on that. <coughs> it's because uh, of the significant things that happen in the book of Acts. And we're, we're going to come up to here in chapter 7. Now, chapter 7 is a long chapter. There's a lot to read. Uh, I debated about not reading all of it, but we're going to because it's important that we uh, that we, we read through this text. Don't need a lot of commentary on any uh, on very much of it until we get up kind of to the to the end of Stephen's uh, argument here, <clears throat> because there's a there's a specific reason why Stephen says the things that he does. He's he he's answering the argument made against him. And as we saw in the last chapter, when Stephen got in disputes with uh, different synagogues and religious groups that didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah and didn't believe in his resurrection and so forth, uh, it tells us that they could not resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spake. So, uh, <clears throat> Stephen is using a logical argument in his defense of Christ, his, his validation of the scriptures, and his defense of Christ's resurrection. He's done that before, and that's what we're going to see him do in this chapter. Now, we're coming up to, on the timeline, um, I guess I could, I don't know if I need to erase that or not, but this is, you know, we saw... Stephen, a classic example of the way Satan operates against people that stand up for Christ. He always attacks the message, he attacks the messenger, and then he discredits the messenger. You'll always see that. You, you see it throughout the scriptures in a number of places. But uh, we're coming up to the point where when Stephen is stoned, that is, well, I am going to have to erase that because I've got to put strike three up there. That strike three against the rulers of Israel. They, and you notice in the bracket down here, during this period of time that we've been looking at in these early chapters of Acts, up through about chapter up to about chapter eight, that's a time when God has, has extended mercy to Israel because back here at Christ's crucifixion, they fulfilled that prophecy in Psalm 2 where they joined with the Gentile leaders and they conspired against the Lord and against his anointed and had him put to death. That made not just the Jewish rulers, but the Gentiles as well, everybody worthy of the day of God's wrath. And by rights, according to you know God's justice and the law and all that, the day of God's wrath should have come as punishment for what they did to the Lord Jesus Christ. But instead of showering uh, you know, uh, wrath and judgment on the world, uh, God extended mercy for one more time. I believe it was a period of about a year. So he extended mercy, gave them three distinct chances to repent once again and trust Christ as their Messiah respond to the sign that was given to them that they asked for, which was his resurrection, and these things. So that's what's, that's what's going on here in these early chapters of Acts. Nothing about Gentiles here. Nothing about the, the church, the body of Christ, that he hasn't even shown up yet. But in chapter 7, uh, when they stoned Stephen to death, well, this is strike three. And uh, the extension of mercy ends. Israel's prophetic program is suspended. And this is where the reason why I'm going over all of this is because if you're going to understand how to rightly divide the word, this is like the foundation that it's built on. You have to understand when this, when this transition happens. And it, we have to understand that, you know, these things that are happening back here, although it's, it's after Christ's resurrection and he's ascended and Pentecost and all that, this is fulfillment of God's covenant prophetic plan with Israel. It doesn't have anything to do with Jews. It doesn't have anything to do with the Gentile body of Christ. During all this time, if Gentiles 
want to be righteous with God, then they've got to do what Gentiles always had to do. They've got to come in under the covenants. They've got to keep the law, get rid of their idols, worship Israel's God, and be a blessing to Israel. And so that, you know, that doesn't change. So we're going to see some examples of that coming up during this transition time. But let me go ahead and put this... Strike three, and they're out. Now, God has not cast off his people Israel. He will eventually complete his covenant plan with them. Their prophetic plan will pick up in the future whenever the seven-year uh, tribulation uh, comes about. That'll be the time when God will finish up his covenant plan with Israel. But right now, their prophetic plan is suspended. They don't have special nation status right now. They're no different from anybody else. And uh, uh, they, you know, many Jews are saved by coming to Christ by faith. And just like Gentiles are. But uh, right now, God is predominantly working through Gentile believers. And as the gospel, we believe, this is Paul's gospel, in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our faith is in. That's what justifies us unto eternal life. Not keeping the law and all this uh, stuff that they had to do back there. So, anyway, uh, we've got our timeline and we'll put that together as we go. And... We're, let's get right into this because we've got a, a lot to read, but it's important, so we'll read this. I mean, this is a Bible study, we'll read the Bible. Okay, chapter 7, Acts chapter 7. Uh, Stephen's being accused and so forth, verse 1. Then said the high priest, are these things so? This question, of course, directed at Stephen because he's been accused of these things of mainly of blasphemy against God and against the temple and against Moses and so forth. But Stephen's face appears as the face of an angel. And with the things he's been doing, the wonders and miracles, this is something God is doing because he is leaving absolutely no doubt that Stephen is a messenger from God. And, and here's one of the things we want to remember here about Stephen. The, the, the things he's saying and the, the role that he's filling right here is as important and as powerful as any of the Old Testament prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, any of those guys. Stephen, is he's in league with those guys because he is speaking by prophetic Revelation. If you're not foreteling the future, but he's he's you know going to rehearse their past. But he's speaking in the authority of God, and and what we're seeing happen here is what Jesus talked about over there in Matthew chapter ten. Remember when he was he was talking to the disciples, and he said, "You're going to be dragged before kings and before the synagogues and all those things." He said, "Don't think, don't even think about what you're going to say beforehand." Because you'll be given what to say in that hour. This is that happening right here. So, anyway. Uh, <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and read through this as Stephen rehearses Israel's history. And notice, notice where he starts. He doesn't go all the way back to creation. He starts at Abraham and with the covenant God made with Abraham. Because that was the beginning of the nation of Israel. And so this is significant to them, uh, the people that he's talking to in that nation. So he said, men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said unto him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran and from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on, yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession, 
and to his seed after him, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, that they should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that they shall come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there was a dearth over all the land of Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known to Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and fifteen souls. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Sychem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emor, the father of Sychem. And if you go back and read up back there in Genesis, the names will be a little bit different. It was Hamor instead of Emor, but it's a little different spelling there. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers, so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. In which time Moses was born, and was exceeding fair, and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. When he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Would thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Then fled Moses at this saying and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. Now notice here, as we, as we read through here, uh, he rehearses through Abraham and, of course, Isaac and Jacob, mainly Jacob, the father of the patriarchs. Then he goes into quite a bit of detail about Moses and his story. Now, it wasn't like these guys that he's talking to had never heard this before. They were familiar with this, and they knew it. But there, the reason why Stephen is is rehearsing through their history and specifically talking about these details of these men specifically is because it was through these men that God made the covenants with the nation of Israel. And these are keystone, uh, I guess we could say, patriarchs in God's plan and purpose with the nation of Israel, having called them out and set them apart as a peculiar people in a holy nation of kings and priests. So that's that's why he's doing this and uh, going over these details and with these specific men. Uh, 
I think we're verse 33. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and have come, come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses, whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel, which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out. After that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Now, notice, get the point that he, he just made, the statement that he just made. He said, this was that same Moses that the people rejected saying, we don't want him to be a ruler over us. He was the one that God chose and sent to be a deliverer of the people. <laughs> and you get where he's going with this, you know. Because that's exactly what they did to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, he goes on with, the, uh, with his statement there, verse 37. Key statement, key scripture. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear. So this was, they knew this scripture. And the thing is, that when Jesus of Nazareth showed up, it was at the right specific time under the right specific conditions and fulfilled all of those prophecies that validated him as that prophet that Moses said would come. Now, you don't have to turn back, but you can if you want to. It's just a one page back over here. Uh, where... Uh, when they, uh, it says, they suborned men which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God and so on. So uh, uh, Moses and against this place. So this was their accusation against Stephen that he was blaspheming Moses and tearing down the traditions and blaspheming God and blaspheming the temple and all this. So he's building this argument to point out to them that nothing that he has said previously in standing up for Christ, testifying for Christ at his resurrection and showing signs and uh, wonders and miracles that validated the power of the Holy Spirit at work in, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, nothing he had said or done in any way, shape, or form disputed or went against anything Moses had ever said or taught or prophesied but in instead it validated exactly what Moses had said would happen so that's what Stephen's doing here he's uh building this uh oh she must be yeah, here. in this state prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me him shall ye hear that was the Lord Jesus Christ he fulfilled that and I mean you really had to be obstinate and stubborn to not see that. I mean, you just had to be almost self-blind. Let's read on. Verse 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. Let me stop right there and I could get on a soapbox about this, but I'm not going to. This is one of the areas where all of the Bible translators, I think, even if you have one of the newer versions, they all still use the same word church. And some of them may have changed it to assembly. This should be assembly right here. Because the word is ecclesia, which means tremendous assembly. amount of confusion has permeated <laughs> Christendom from not understanding the usage of this word church. And, you know, it seems pretty simple. You know, you don't you don't have to you don't have to dig a long time. I know Steve has done some some pretty good study on this uh, in years past. It's not like you've got to be a tremendous Bible scholar to understand that th this word means a, an assembly of people. But religion has taken this and assumed that because it says church here, that it means 
all believers for all time are all members of the same unit, same body, same assembly. And that's not the case because this, you know, using the word church here, it doesn't have anything to do with the church, the body of Christ that we are members of. We are members of the body of Christ because our faith is in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and we're Gentiles anyway. This is this; These were all Jews here. In the assembly that was in the wilderness, weren't any Gentiles in there with them. So we just want to make sure, and I'm not going to dwell on this because it's, it's outside of the point. But this is one, you may, you may even have a, you know, a footnote or something that says assembly there. But that's what it should be. And we want to make sure that we understand that, that in the Bible, uh, you can have the same word, but it doesn't always mean the same thing. And it's not always talking about the same group of people. Context determines meaning. And so anyway, let's move on. Uh the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them, and in their hearts turned back again into Egypt, saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us, for as for this Moses which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the work of their own hands, which, I mean, you know, they had come out of uh, idolatry in Egypt, and I guess they brought a lot of that with them. It's unfortunate, but that's what happened. And uh, I don't know if you remember the story in there, Aaron, Moses' brother Aaron, and his excuse was, hey, I threw the gold in the fire and this calf came out. <laughs> Uh, made a calf in those days, offered sacrifice, and they will rejoice in the work of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven that is written in the book of the prophets. O ye house of Israel, have ye offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Rimphan, figures which ye made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Now, He's uh, turning the argument back on them, and he's pointing out that back way back there, the ones that laid that led the nation into idolatry were the leaders of the nation, and so uh, he's kind of boomeranging their accusation back on them, and kind of pointing out that they're doing the same thing. Verse 44, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus, that would be Joshua, which, you know, Joshua is the, Joshua and Jesus is the same, basically the same name, Yeshua, if we wanted to go with a, more, a little more accurate Uh Rendering of the word. Into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers unto the days of David, who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Now, here's where Stephen is coming down to kind of the, the main point in his argument. He's, he's answering the false accusations that have been made against him, and he's building this kind of chain of logic through the scriptures right up to this point. And he has already pointed out how that uh, he hadn't said anything against Abraham or against the covenants, against the Abrahamic covenant. He hadn't said anything that blasphemed Moses. In fact, his, his 
preaching previous to that and his argument before these groups that were uh, disputing with him had validated Moses. His, all the things he said about the Lord Jesus Christ validated things that Moses said and the prophets. And now the accusation against him about blaspheming the temple, he's, uh, he's answering that with this point right here. In verse 48, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet, Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? So he's, he's bringing this down to, you're, you're accusing me of blaspheming God and blaspheming the temple, or that by, by blaspheming the temple, I'm blaspheming God, and he's reminding them of something that they should know, but I don't think they do know it. That look, this temple that you guys worship, and y'all are so, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, not really protective, but obsessed with the, the temple and all that. That you, you know, you worship this structure and this place when you're not considering the fact that God does not dwell here. You know, uh, what 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 possible man-made house or structure can contain? the God of the universe that made all these things. That, that's the point he's making here. So through all of this, he's not just ranting and raving. He's not just rambling through their history, but he goes through Abraham, the covenant God made with Abraham, uh, the covenant that came through Moses there in Exodus chapter 19, where God said you'll be a nation, a holy nation, of a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, peculiar people, and so on. The covenant with David, the you know the uh, Davidic covenant uh, that gives so many details about the Messiah and he would be uh, the son of David and so on like that. And then he comes down here and, and points this out in the temple and how they actually were the one the the leaders were the ones that led the nation into into idolatry and that. It's, you know, God doesn't dwell in a temple made with hands. So he kind of tears down their argument that it's a moot point anyway. Uh, blaspheming the temple. You, how can, you can't blaspheme the temple. The temple's not a God. And so on like that. So that's what he's doing here. Tearing down their argument. And then verse 51. He goes on in... Uh, he uh, gets directly, you know, kind of in their face, we would say. It says, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Okay. You can't do it on this. All right. Um, let me see. Well, I don't want to erase all of that. Well, I don't need to put a time on it. Okay. Back, if, if y'all remember anything about the, the five cycles of judgment that we find back there in Leviticus 26, we refer to it back, back to it a lot. Okay. If you remember, when they went through those cycles of judgment, and it came up to the, actually the, the fourth cycle of judgment, God warned them. He said, if you walk contrary to me, I'm going to walk contrary to you. Walk con walking contrary to God means treating him as though he is not your God. Saying, I don't know you. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Don't want any of your stuff. Don't want to keep your laws. Not going to make your sacrifices. We've got other gods over here and you know, where you're not our God. That, that's basically walking contrary to God. Well, Israel did that. After all the things God had done, he had given them the power of his name. Uh, he delivered them out of Egypt. 
led them through the wilderness, took them into the land, kept his promises to them, showed mercy and grace to them, and all these things. Yet, in spite of all that, they turned away from him. They <coughs> worshipped idols and all that. So they, back there, they walked contrary to God. They rejected God, the Creator, God, Jehovah God, uh, or Yahweh, if you want to use that term, God the Father. Now, then Jesus came along, uh, validated all of those things, all of those prophecies and scriptures pointing to him as the Messiah. So, at that point, what did they do? They did the same thing. They rejected Jesus, God's son. So that was the second member of the Godhead they rejected. And now, when Stephen says this, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Now, at this point, they're rejecting the third member of the Godhead. They're rejecting the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. After all of those things they've seen, all of these tremendous miracles and signs and wonders that the apostles have been doing during this time and and the things they've said and the changes they're seeing in people as they're coming to, to believe in Christ and that remnant of Israel is growing and all that. In spite of that, they reject it. And this is the indictment against them. Now, stiff neck, we know that basically means stubborn, obstinate. But when he, when he tells them that they're uncircumcised and hard in ears, that's not just a, you know... A, like a disrespectful thing to say that he doesn't say that to provoke them to anything. It has a meaning. And what that means is, is that by telling them that they are uncircumcised, that that puts them outside of God's plan and purpose. That puts them outside of his favor, outside of the covenants, outside of his working. That means that they have, nothing to do with God and God has nothing to do with them. They have walked contrary to God and now he has walked contrary to them and they are outside. doesn't matter that they're the high priest and they're the Jewish council and they're the you know uh, Sadducees and all of that. None of that matters. Here's Stephen speaking to them with the power and authority of a prophet of God. <laughs> And he's telling them this, that they are outside of God's plan and purpose. They don't have anything to do with it. They are not blessed of God. And when the kingdom comes in, which is what they're still looking for, they're not going to have a part in the kingdom of heaven when it comes in. So that's, that, that's kind of what's, in a nutshell, tied up in this statement that he's making to them. So, verse 52. You know, and instead of repenting as they should have and all the things they had done, they had just turned the worship of the true God into just one more pagan cult. That's pretty much what it was. So, uh, verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, which we know even Jesus even said that to the rulers, you know, that they're, uh, they were just like their fathers who had slain the prophets and so on like that from uh, all the way through. And these men were of the same belief. They were offspring of those rulers back there that did the wrong thing. And these guys just continued that right through. Said so they had uh, uh, slain and was showed before the coming of the just one. And uh, that uh, means that the sinless, blameless, righteous by nature. You know, there's a lot contained in that title there. And uh, probably should, uh, you know, <clears throat> stop and really take a look at that. Maybe we'll come back to that sometime. Because it's rich. It's 
it's really neat. It's interesting there. There's a lot in that title. But we'll move on. He says, uh, you have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Boy, that, to these guys, that was the worst thing you could say to them was that, you know, you have the law, you're going on and on about Moses. Moses received it from angels and so on, and he handed it down. And you guys, you religious leaders, you're the, the guardians of the law and the traditions and the temple and all that. And you have not kept it. And this goes back to you know a lot of things. Uh, Jesus said the same thing. To them, to the religious rulers. Now, this was what they couldn't take. Number one, for him to point out to them that they were in their hearts and ears, they were uncircumcised outside of God's plan and purpose, separated from God and not part of his kingdom. And then to tell them that they uh, had not kept the law, it was more than they could take. And then it comes down to it, verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. You know, the gnashing of teeth uh, is like, uh, I mean, they weren't biting him. It was like a, you know, like that. That's what they were doing. Angry, angry, vicious, <laughs> angry men. They're just, you know, uh, like that. And uh, <laughs> this is a, they're about to explode. They're so mad. And I think, you know, Stephen knows what's going to happen. Uh, it's just a, just a matter of time that, you know, uh, I think he knows that they're going to kill him already. And so, you know, outraged, here they go. It says, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, here's a, here's a, 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 a super important thing we need to understand of what's happening here. And this goes along with our understanding of rightly dividing the word. And what's happening in Israel's prophetic plan and program. And the significance of Stephen looking up and seeing Jesus standing. Now, we know that when he ascended into heaven, what happened? just almost immediately there. He was seated at the right hand of God. So, but here we find Jesus standing. Now, when you don't understand what's going on here, because, oh, I don't know, just rather spend time playing golf than studying the Bible or whatever reason, or you're a big egghead theologian and, you know, think you know everything or whatever, and don't. If you don't know what's going on here, you're going to think, well, isn't this, isn't this wonderful? Jesus is standing up there to honor Stephen, and he's, he's standing up to receive this, you know, the, well, a lot of people call Stephen the first Christian martyr, you know, which he's really not. He's a member of the body of the uh, remnant of Israel, so not the same thing, but that's not why Jesus is standing here. Let's look at Psalm 68. This is uh, one scripture we can go back to and we'll give, it will give us some insight into what's going on here. Psalm 68, verse 1. 
It says, let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. <coughs> let them also that hate him flee before him. This is what was about to happen. This is why Jesus stood up. Because they, they had just struck out those leaders. God, after what they had done here that made them absolutely deserving of the day of God's wrath to be poured out on them at this point. But instead, he extended mercy to them and sent the Holy Spirit with all these tremendous signs and wonders and miracles and, and powerful speaking by Peter and all the other apostles. And they're teaching every day in the temple and house to house and Stephen and, and these other guys and all the tremendous things that are going on that are undeniable. And yet, these leaders still... They reject it, and they deny Christ, and they turn their backs on God, and they walk contrary to God. They, according to what they did back here, they set themselves up as the enemies of God, and they were declaring themselves as God's enemies. And so when Jesus stood up from off of his rightful place, seated at the right hand of God, he, didn't, he wasn't standing up to receive Stephen the martyr. He was standing up because he was about to step out with his army of heaven, and he was about to come back and put his foot on the neck of his enemies, and it was those guys. And they knew that. When, when Stephen looked up and he said what he did, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. They understood that after what he had just said to them. He had just indicted them that they had made themselves the enemies and murderers of the very Son of God. And so by telling them that, and then when he said, I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God, they knew the scriptures enough. They knew that when he stands, it's time for him to come back and put his neck on the feet, uh, his his foot on the neck of his enemies and conquer his enemies and and bring in the day of wrath and then he's going to set up his kingdom and the enemies according to what Stephen is saying here and I think where it says they were cut to the heart there's conviction in there that they know that he's right they know that what Stephen is saying is right but because of their stiff neckedness they will not accept it, you know. They will not accept it. And uh, that's their choice. But when that happens, they know that that enemy that he's coming back to conquer is them. And they're going to be on the side of enemies of God when Jesus Christ returns. And uh, that's, that's what they're, you know, uh, that's one of the reasons they're so enraged. And that's one of the reasons why it says, Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. That's because they, they know what he's saying. And they know what's going on here. So anyway, this is one of those things that it's, it's important for us to understand. It's important for us to rightly divide the word of truth. Because then we understand what's going on here. And we understand that this is, this is the turning point. And at, at this point, the transition begins. And Israel's program is suspended at that point. And from here going forward, we're, gonna, we're still going to see Peter and some of the, the apostles, and they're going to be doing some things. But we'll notice immediately when we get into chapter 8, they're going to be scattered out, except for like the 12 apostles. They stay in Jerusalem, but that's what they were told to do. Jesus told them to, to stay there and wait because they're expecting him to come back to the Mount of Olives. And, and you know, that's from what they understand, that's where they need to be until, you know, it gets so bad that they're all finally scattered out. But for the time being, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, anyway, we'll begin to see that the remnant of Israel, the believers, they begin to be scattered out. Uh, Israel begins to diminish here in just a few chapters. We'll see 
Peter goes away, he goes out, and Paul comes in. Paul comes in with revelation that the Lord himself gives him a whole different body of teaching for the church, the assembly, the body of Christ, made up of Jew and Gentile, primarily Gentile. Because a shift is going to happen. Back here, God is still working through his covenant people, the nation of Israel. Because that's what he said he was going to do, and that's what he's doing up until this point. When he stops working primarily with them, he shifts over and he begins doing a work with primarily through Gentiles. And that's what's still going on today. So... And that's kind of core of rightly dividing the word. It's, un, you know, it's important to understand that. That way we're not lumping things that uh, belong back here and trying to drag things out and apply it to us that really don't apply. We're trying to apply our stuff to them. But anyway, uh, let's get back to our scriptures. So that, that's the reason why Jesus is standing here. This is what's about to happen. But... It doesn't happen, and there's a reason why, and that is because God had something in mind that he was going to do that he had kept secret from the foundation of the world. Romans 16, 25, we, we look at that from time to time, where Paul you know, writes that this is the, the mystery of the gospel that was kept secret from the foundation of the world. It wasn't revealed uh, through the prophets like Israel's program was. And the reason that Jesus stands here and everything is ready for him to come back, conquer his enemies, and set up his kingdom, that doesn't happen because God had something else he was going to do in his mind that he hadn't told anybody about. And we'll look at that as we go through, uh, mainly in chapter 9 when we get into that with Paul. So, Verse 57, then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And you know, think it's just accidental that this, that this happened? It's not accidental. You know, and, and here's... Saul, and we'll see more details about him in the next chapter, but <clears throat> the genius of the way God works and how he does things in that, okay, he's going to take Saul that is Satan's man on the scene to try to destroy the believing remnant of Israel. That's Satan's policy of evil, in at work here is he wants to try to destroy that group of Jewish believers in Christ. And he's going to use Paul to do that. So what is God going to do? He's going to go in here and he's going to take Satan's top agent and turn him around and use him to be the primary uh, apostle. For the body of Christ. What happened? Something makes noise to scare you. Could you see this as being a thorn in Paul's side? You know, he talks about a thorn in his side, but you could see that would be a thorn in his side. I for guarantee all of his you, life. there wasn't not a day went by that <laughs> he didn't remember this right here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Every day, I guarantee you, every night. Paul laid down to go to sleep. He remembered this. I, I guarantee you, he did. You know, and but he he states that. I think over there in, in Galatians, I think it is, where you know uh, talks about these things, and he said that the Lord chose me to demonstrate the powerful working of His grace. You know, and so. Yeah, I, I, oh yeah. And, and here's another thing about, about Saul as he goes through this. Okay, well, let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and read through this because there's a... Uh, well, no, anyway. 
Okay, they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. But then look at 8 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. So for this statement to be in there, Saul would have had to have been a member of the council or something. Because if he was just an ordinary, you know, student or whatever uh, rabbi or Pharisee, well, what difference would it make where he consented to it or not? They didn't need everybody consent to consent to a death. They just needed the uh, uh, the ruling council to do it. So, well, if, <clears throat> normally you know, when a crowd is uh, uprising, there is an agitator. Yeah, and it would probably. Very likely was, you know, because we know that that's what he goes on to do, Paul, you know. Paul described himself as a Pharisee of the Pharisee. Yeah. He was a high-ranking Pharisee. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, he probably was a, more instrumental in this than what the details give. But, you know, Luke wrote this, and... I mean, he was with Paul everywhere, an associate. When Luke wrote this, he may have kind of toned things down a little bit. He may not have put all the details in here. It's like one of us would do. I mean, if, if one of us was became friends with somebody that had just been, I mean, a rank, anti-Christian, hated everything to do with it, <coughs> the Bible and Christ, and then, and then you know, it just persecuted as much as they could Christians and then uh, converted and became a Christian well even if we knew the details we wouldn't you know talk about or write down I mean just you know it's speculation but it could be it could be that there uh, uh, maybe Luke kind of left out some things for Paul's benefit but Paul knew all that stuff and two that if, if I understand their legal workings fairly accurately it wasn't that much different than ours you know you had a you had the right to face your accusers so when or you had to you you had the right to answer accusations brought against you yeah now, now in in our legal system now in the religious system you don't get to face your accusers you know they they get other people to do their dirty work for them but anyway uh point is every time Saul arrested somebody every time he drug them before the court every time he prosecuted them he had to listen to their testimony every single time <laughs> and he had to hear testimonies about the healings and about the wonders and the miracles and, and he had to hear these people and they're testifying the scriptures about Christ's resurrection he had to listen to eyewitness testimony of people that saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And they were, I mean, there, some of those 500 people that he mentions over in, I think it's Galatians. Uh, Paul, no doubt some of those people were some of the ones he arrested and drove before the courts. And he had to listen to them, testify. And so, all of that was working on his mind, working on his mind. Now, I think that's what Jesus was talking about. And we'll see this over in chapter 9 when he said, it's hard for you to kick against the goads or the, you know, the pricks. Because all those things were goading Paul, you know, on and on and on. And, and uh, he, he and, and somewhere in his mind, he knew, he knew that it was right, that, that Jesus was the Messiah. But because of tradition and everything, just like these guys in this council, they would not repent. They would they would not even hear it. And, you know, that's, uh, I mean, that's kind of the nature of a lot of religious thinking or dogma. Uh, a refusal to even listen to anything else to even be open-minded at all and examine or, or, or you know, ask questions or uh, 
seek for explanation to uh, understand that it's okay to not understand everything, you know, those kind of things. But uh, anyway, that's, you know, that's what we see here in, uh, in Saul kind of that way. Uh, we, we have a lot of that today. And uh, a religious kind of a dogma, I guess you would say, refusal to listen to any other viewpoint. Uh, anyway. So Stephen here is stoned and to his credit, he uh, kneels down and cries with a loud voice, asking God to have mercy on them and not to lay that sin to their charge. When he said that, he fell asleep. We saw in Jerusalem the place that is supposed to be, yeah, you know, those places. They got all these holy places. It's supposed to be the place where Stephen was stoned. <coughs> and it's this rock ledge right there. And it's, uh, you got the Church of St. Stephen down there. It's right, right on the edge of the Kidron Valley. And there's kind of a sort of a grotto, you know, the, it seemed like for some reason the Catholics way back, in, you know, third century, wherever, everything had to be in some kind of grotto. Everything happened in some kind of grotto, you know. This grotto there, and this stone down there, and it's supposed to be where uh, Stephen was stoned to death. There's no way to know if it really was. And it's kind of funny if you go back and you look at photographs from the same area back in the, like, 18... 80s, 90s, it all looks different. <laughs> it looks completely different, like it's all been excavated or backfilled or something. But anyway, we saw the place. Beautiful artwork in there, in the Church of uh, St. Stephen. An interesting place. Uh, so Stephen becomes a martyr. And uh, at this point, this is strike three. And the rulers of Israel are, you know, they're out. Uh, their program is suspended. We're going to begin to see the transition as we go into chapter 8. And Israel's diminishing. And we'll see the emergence of the church, the body of Christ, and Paul, and so on like that. The book of Acts has a purpose. And its purpose, well, I mean, to, to inform us as well, but it's also to inform or explain to Israel what happened. What happened here? Why did things change? And what did they change to? So, you know, the book of Acts is not just telling a bunch of stories about neat stuff the apostles did and miracles and all that. It has a purpose, and that's its purpose, to tell the story of the transition from Israel's program to the church, the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace that we're in now. So anyway, we'll uh, pick up in chapter 8 next time. Anybody got anything, comments or questions? I was just thinking that the first church in the wilderness, under that way of translating, would be pre-Christ. Shouldn't, shouldn't it be halfway correct to say the temple in the wilderness? Well, I mean, that's you really, really interpret do it as a, <laughs> as a structure. Yeah, 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 yeah. It should be a temple. Right. They didn't even have the temple, they had the tabernacle. Yeah. You know. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, in our vernacular today, when we talk about the church, we're talking about a building. <laughs> uh, you know. When you have a building, you have a, a hierarchy, you have a hierarchy, yeah. you have a head of the hierarchy, and that's where that yeah. comes from. You got to. You know, you have the Catholic Church designed that. Yeah, for us. yeah, yeah, yeah. They did, and uh, it carried over to every, pretty much every denomination. It's pretty much followed that same path. Well, they follow the yeah. King James translation. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The Puritan yeah. didn't want it in there. And King James said it's going to be in there, so that's huh. the way it evolved. Yeah. Huh. What did the Puritans? They wanted uh, assembly or ecclesia or assembly, something like that. Yeah. Assembly. But really, it, it should have been. Mm. 
All right. <clears throat> There's nothing else, and we'll pray. And